evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin. You're watching Consider This. Today on the show, we have Dr. Alexander Gerlach, who is a senior fellow at the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs. And he's also a columnist at DW. He's got a column called Gerlach Global, which touches on the future of democracy and the liberal world order, which is precisely what we're going to be discussing today. Welcome to the show, Alex. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. So, you know, we're going to be um, celebrating the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall this Saturday. And I wanted to talk to you about the Germany you grew up in and the Germany of today. So talk to us a bit about how Germany has changed and the assumptions that you once grew up with are now being challenged. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, like, I was 13 years old when the war came down, literally like until very, like, let's say the summer of the year. Nobody would have thought it and deemed it possible the wall ever to come down. So we were like literally like surprised when we saw how the people like took the streets like in the weeks before the wall came down and how it was literally like effectively with one stroke of a pen or like one sentence of this one functionary of the Communist Party was just like open for all Germans. It was like a very, a very joyous night. Um, in result, it meant to me, um, and I, was, I re realized this years later in my work as a journalist, actually, I had a colleague who was 10 years younger than me, and he wrote um, a self-description, and he said he grew up, he became politically aware in the time between 9-11 and the, the Lehman Brothers collapse of the bank, and I thought, wait a minute, so I became politically aware after the fall of the Berlin Wall, how positive this time was. You know, like when I was a child, you could not go like very far east from where I'm from, there was like the Iron Curtain that divided Europe. Mm. And my like adolescence and then my me being a young man and a student, actually the world was free and was open and that basically shaped my idea of the world. Right. You know, one of the most recent headlines we had coming out of Germany was uh, the city council of Dresden, you know, declared a Nazi crisis, you know, along like in uh, analogous to a sort of ecological crisis. And I know there's been there's the complexities of that story, but uh, it sort of signals a Germany where there's a resurgent right wing um, and, that we, and part of the European story. I mean, does that surprise you that and coming from what is formerly the East Germany? So what happened after the, after the end of the Second World War, so the Eastern sector was taken by the Russians and the other three were the other like allies, France, Britain and the United States. And that in the West, what became Western Germany, they started a denazification. And um, this was also like a hard endeavor. It took like one generation in the 60s, 80s, as we called them, you know, the time when this global like um, um, movement broke. And then these children would ask their parents, Dad, what did you do in the war? So even in Western Germany, it took a long time until denazification denazification took a strong hold. Having said that, in the eastern part, however, where the Russians took over, it would not, did not deploy into democracy, so there was like the next dictatorship moving in, and so what they did was they just declared Nazidom over without like having like a public sort of like movement and like, you know, as we had in, in Western Germany, which leads in effect to that Nazis were never a Nazidom or the thoughts of or the ideologies of the Nazis was, was never defeated. So after the war came down in 1989 and 1990, you, you, now we see like reports about like how, how students in school, in high school back then, debated like, I mean, but Nazi thoughts have been around forever. They were just like covered up under the, the communist uh, era and the communist dictatorship and now you see like for the new right-wing party which we unfortunately have in western germany there's like 10 percent of people rooting for them but in eastern germany it's up to 30. so you clearly right. see there's a difference because in eastern germany there was never like a period where they like denazificated okay. you know one of the things that you suggest is that ideas never die mm. Mm. and even bad ideas remain with us right and so the question of whether democracies can uh, remain true to their core while keeping hold of this. Like an, uh, an expression that you've used in the past, you know, can, how do the tolerant deal with the intolerant? How do you, how do you, can you unpack that for us? I mean, yeah, so like when we talk about liberal democracy, literally we mean like the iteration of democracy we have nowadays. And that entails a few things. When we look like back, far back into history, like in the antiquities, only the man, the father of the family could go and engage in politics. Until a hundred years ago, women were not allowed to vote. So now nowadays, our iteration of democracy now says us basically, there is not such a thing as the dominion of a majority over a minority. If you win an election this, this time, maybe next time, 
time another party wins or even you as a voter you may change affiliation so like it's a it's about the society as a whole and the society has majorities and minorities but they all have to somehow like get along with one another mm. and that's basically what liberal uh, democracy means so and there is no such thing as a non-liberal democracy nowadays because we don't want to go back to the times where women had no suffrage right so that's actually the the setup of democracy and nowadays you find these like they call themselves illiberals and what they mean is like we define who the majority is and the, the majority rules over the minorities and period and that's not what we have deployed after the horrors of the second world war and the Shoah. Right. So so then why are these you know ideas that never die why are these ideas seeing emergence once again 30% in East Germany said it's also like a, a global phenomenon like look when you when you I'm not I'm, I'm not shying away from the German question but I give a broader concept here like in America when Barack Obama was elected president he was highlighting uh, that he ha is of Kenyan descent and he has relatives all over the planet and he made and labeled this an American story and it's actually true it's a very cosmopolitan one and shows you that you are connected to other parts of the world whereas when Donald Trump uh, came about he's he's not he's He's never getting tired to say he's a nationalist. And what he means by that is, in uh, American terms, he's an isolationist. So there is like, well, I'm saying this, neither Donald Trump invented this idea, nor did Barack Obama invent this idea. The idea and the struggle to whether or not the United States are a cosmopolitan nation or a white nation for white people is, uh, is around since the foundation of the nation. Mm. And so it's like the Germans have always had like the question, are we Western? Are we like looking towards the East? So and this is what they call it the German German Sonderweg, the particular way of the Germans. And nowadays you find in Germany lots of people like leaning towards the United States and you find also people leaning towards Russia because Germany is geographically like, um, yo, well, positioned in the middle in the of middle, Europe. Yeah. <laughs> However, having said that, specifically because of the Nazi past, I believe like democratic ideas have set root very quickly in Germany and the German society has become rather liberal over the course of the last 70 years because they did not want to see uh, history repeating itself. All right, we're going to continue this conversation on the liberal world order in just a couple of minutes right here on Consider This. Make sure you stay tuned.